So we're going to do, you know, plug in our u n m is equal to g to the mth power, e to the i, so you n h. Okay. So again, you start plugging this in, you get g of m plus one, e to the i, so n h, is equal to g of m minus one, e to the i, so n h plus two lambda. And then what you got left over here is g of m, e to the i, c of m plus 1h, minus 2, e to the i, c of n, h, uh, plus g, oh, and this has a g of m with it, and then g of m, e to the i, c of n minus 1h. All right? So just like before, g of m is everywhere. Kill them off. Okay? Divide through by g of m, you're going to left with 1g here. And then also multiply by e to the minus i c of n h. Kills that one. Kills that one. All these g of m's go away. What's left over is now, oh, by the way, we killed that one because we multiply by e to the negative i c of n h. So there's a minus 2 over here. Here you get e to the i c of n plus 1 minus c of n h plus e to the minus i, oh, sorry, e to the i, c of n minus 1 minus c of n h. And if we use our trick again, where we say c of n is equal to n times zeta, then I have, these become e to the i zeta h plus e to the minus i zeta h. OK, there we go. Got the right rotation. Um, huh. So I think uh, Formula 848 in your notes, who wrote this stuff? I think it might be wrong. Because uh, I think that's going to be a, a cosine. Is everyone going to agree with me on that? This is going to be to the e to the i zeta h plus e to the minus i zeta h, and that is cosine. If you had a minus there, it's a sine, right? Yes. I'm, oh, sorry, there. Yeah. But still, like, that, this is the big sign I was trying to, yeah. All right, well, listen, hey, I love catching errors in the middle of lecture. It's awesome. Which brings us to, I only have two rules about teaching. So I gave you some, I'm, I like to drop gems on you just because it's for free, right? So like, remember, cup in hand, Halloween trick-or-treating, good stuff. Here's even better. Two things you never do. Really, trust me on these. Don't do algebra in public. Two, don't do spelling in public. You only mess up and look bad. I'm telling you from experience. I'm helping you. Help me help you, okay? So. Right now we say that kind of got messed up. I know there's going to be a cosine here. I've got to put a 2 under here. And we're going to go right to, uh, yeah, pretty much I don't work it out, do I? Uh, so interestingly enough, uh, after you do the right algebra, what you find, you find some value of g. And I know this, too, so I, I got the conclusion right. That's the only thing that matters. What you're going to find is, G is bigger than 1 for all lambda. So it turns out, if you do leapfrog with the heat equation, it's always unstable. So, so in other words, the one thing I want to point out with this is you have leapfrog, which worked great with the wave equation. Leapfrog sucks with heat equation, right? So schemes change a lot that work on different equations. So in fact, leapfrog is sort of the basis of what's called FTDT. Have anybody heard that? If you do computational electromagnetics, FTDT is what they always use, finite difference time domain. And they just leap, use leapfrog everywhere. Why? Because it's wave behavior. And for wave behavior, leapfrog's awesome. For other things, leapfrog is not awesome. OK? And in fact, Part of the reason I started with this is to say, hey, look at that. Well, 
we should use leapfrog because it was stable before. And in fact, Euler was unstable before, if you remember. No matter what I did with Euler, it wasn't going to work with his wave equation. But it turns out, if we try to do Euler here, <coughs> all right, then here's the big change of the step, which is instead of me using the point future and point behind, I can use this. Current point, point in the future, divided by delta t. To make very little change in what we get out of here, it's going to take away that factor of 2 and do this. If you weren't paying attention or if all of a sudden you were thinking daydreaming and you just focused back in on me, you would say, did he change anything on the board? Okay. All right, daydreamers. This is the great thing about watching it at home. You go, what did he do, do again? <laughs> you drive right back and then you watch it again. Watch my trickery. Okay, I just did a little bit of changing. It doesn't change this very much. You still have really very similar looking um, iteration scheme. Okay, so now we can go through and do the same uh, Euler. I mean, we can do the von Neumann analysis here, and you'll notice it changes very little. This will no longer be g to minus 1. It's going to be g, and that 2 is out. So you don't get a 1 over g here. You get a 1, and there's no 2 there. Okay, and what you find... Again, I think I have an error there, but let's just write this thing down because I, I know this result is right. For Euler, if you use an Euler scheme on the heat equation, you'll find that the g value is less than 1 if lambda, actually, less than or equal to 1 for lambda less than or equal to half. So in other words, you have a stable region now. Your constraint on the CFL is that it has to be less than a half, and this thing will work for Fourier Euler. Yeah. Um, so, I'm trying to make sure I understand. For the wave equation, it was the leapfrog that worked. Yes. But, so, is that supposed to be a m plus, or m minus one? Oh. For, right to the right of the equal sign? Yeah, you can't see it? <laughs> yeah, it's totally, you need, everybody can see it, right? <laughs> no, seriously, you should get some glasses. Yeah, no, it's just supposed to be a minus one. Okay, so that's, that one's leapfrog. That's leapfrog. That's yes. the stable. Sorry. Okay. So, so little one. You're looking at it. It looks the same. Yes, minus one there. Leapfrog is stable for wave equation. Leapfrog is unstable for heat equations. And by the way, these are sort of generic trends. So there's a big difference in type of equation we have, in types of physical behavior. So this is an important take-home message partly here, right, which is, you're going to be, let's say, simulating some system. And one of the evaluations you do about your system is fairly simple. Right up front, you say, hey, um, what kind of behavior do I expect? If you're working in the atmosphere and you're looking at dynamics of the atmosphere, it's dominated by advection or fluid transport that's basically being shoveled around. It's wave propagation, nonlinear wave propagation even. And so in that case, you have to start thinking right away about, oh, I have waves. That's the thing I'm trying to quantify. So you might want to pick a scheme that sort of has nice stability properties for waves. Okay? Whereas if you're looking at a problem where you have, you know, so for instance, if you're a mechanical engineer and you're looking at heating on a, some kind of crazy looking structure and you're looking at heat dissipation on that thing, don't use a leapfrog on that. Right? You want to start using schemes that model the heat portion of your equation nicely. In practice, even in your homework four, where we're going to have the advection diffusion, did you notice the combination of the two words? Advection diffusion. We have both types of behaviors in the system. But it's primarily dominated by the advection with just a little bit of diffusion on it. Okay? So typically when you pick schemes, it's not just a matter of saying, hey, I can just take one that seems to work for everything. It turns out there is no scheme that works well for everything, really. At the end of the day, you have a specific problem. There's usually like this one here takes advantage of some things, and it works really well for that specific problem. And you can't go over here and say, I'll forearm shiver this problem, because maybe a forearm shiver here is just a little, I don't know, something weak over there, like, a, like being an Oregon duck. 
Any questions on that? Because that was so clear. Yeah. Is there something you can look at in the leapfrog method and say this will work for first derivative and not for second? Or you look at Fort Euler and say this will work for second derivative and not for first? I mean, something intrinsically in the structure, or you just have to work through the whole von Neumann and, and it comes out one way or the other and it's not intuitive or not? So I don't know if there's a, so it's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that, at least for me personally. Uh, how, or at least most of the people I know personally, what they just know is they've learned it in numerical analysis, so they've, they've learned it by experience to say, hey, this is bad over here, this is good over here, but it's not like an obvious physical interpretation of, oh, you should use this, and it's clear because. I, I haven't seen that. It just, you work on it enough and you know this stuff works here, this stuff works over here, you have it in your head, and then, and then it makes you sound awesome. Okay. All right, good with that. So. Scheme selection, big deal. CFL, big deal.